sick and tired of hearing about all of the radicals and the perverts and the liberals and the leftists and the communists coming out of the closets. It's time for God's people to come out of the closets, out of the churches, and change America. We must do it. We've got to raise up an army of men and women in America who will call this nation back to moral sanity and sensibility. I call that the moral majority. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose people we remember that this is a celebration, not a funeral. Praise God. Let's be happy with it. With life and liberty for all who believe. Life and liberty for all who believe? Do you know what the traditional Christian pledge says? One brotherhood uniting all mankind in service and love. I'm Bert Lancaster, and if you're shocked as I am, that some ministers have rewritten the Christian pledge to suggest that liberty is only for those who believe their way, then please, stay with me for an extraordinary program. You'll see that we as a nation are besieged today by a powerful, wealthy movement with one dangerous goal, to mix religion with partisan politics so they can force, I mean force, their narrow doctrine on all of us. Religion is important to the life of America. And religious values are important in our individual lives. But also important is another basic American value. Freedom. To speak, believe, and worship as we choose. There are some groups attacking these freedoms. They're sometimes called the moral majority. Sometimes Christian voice or religious roundtable. You're about to see for yourself what they're attempting to do. From the auditorium of the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia... The Faith Partners and Friends present Jerry Falwell and the Old Time Gospel Hour. Solomon Theirs is an electronic church, a vast technological pulpit that reaches 40 million Americans every week on 1,100 religious radio stations, almost 1,000 television stations, four satellite networks. A faith partner gives $10 every month to keep the program on the station where they live. It is a pulpit whose success has been measured in a constant flow of donations. I'll send a pulpit that increasingly uses religion to preach politics. I'll send one whose marketing must be as skillful as its message. Once a month, I'll write you and enclose that envelope for your convenience. I want you to have this uh, uh, handbook here, which is the distillation of many years of counseling to millions of people. We're building a national spot that shows an overview of the ministry, shows everything that we do, okay, very quickly, so that those things will already, already have been shown, and so you have a platform to then come out right into it. I'm asking you for $100,000 tonight. I sincerely believe it to be in God's will for us to have the television camera that will make it possible for us to be so much more effective. Would you help us? People do help, sending the TV preachers millions of dollars every week. It's money from those who are fearful, seeking assurance. But by sending religious gifts, their names can become part of political mailing lists. And for the radical right clients of the Richard Vigory Direct Mail Company, the TV audience is a treasure to be mined for far more than money. A leader of their network calls these donors a standing army ready to be called to battle in a political war. It's a call that will be sounded in the churches, not by preachers, but by politicians. We are talking about Christianizing America. Amen. We are talking about simply spreading the gospel in a political context. And therefore, you have to be able to put things in, if you will, simplistic, polemical terms. Ultimately, everything can be reduced to right and wrong. Everything. The Washington operatives mastermind a new strategy, one that will confuse religion with politics. Paul Weyrich knows the radical right agenda he has long pursued will benefit from a religious cloak, as does Howard Phillips, head of the conservative caucus. They also know the crucial step is convincing some preachers to come along. So they launch a new coalition. And Phillips sends his field director, Ed McAteer, to run the religious roundtable. They oppose nuclear arms control in the name of religion and even claim social security is inconsistent with the Bible. 
Jerry Falwell is the first of the TV preachers to answer the political call. He forms his own organization and gives it a name Wyrick has thought up, Moral Majority. I don't think we'll talk about it here, but you give me... Falwell's joined by James Robison, the Texas evangelist who invites the group to Dallas, where they will conduct a massive training school for the 15,000 preachers they have summoned there. We have a threefold primary responsibility. Number one, get people saved. Number two, get them baptized. Number three, get them registered to vote. Now, many of our Christians have what I call the goo-goo syndrome, good government. They want everybody to vote. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. Don't you commit yourself to some political party or politician. You commit yourself to the principles of God and demand those parties and politicians align themselves with the eternal values in this book. And America will be forever the greatest nation on this earth. We will contact the 50 men who in turn will call every congressional district director who in turn will call every church within his congressional district. And that way... The lessons taught in Dallas are carried to churches and church basements across the country. Sunday service, we can mobilize four to six million people with whatever project needs to be mobilized on a national Senator level. Senator to... Jesse Helms. Jesse, it's good to have you. Falwell claims a divine mandate to change America by changing the Congress. And he's embraced Jerry by Rose politicians whose political goals he shares. Say, I'll stand with Jerry Fall or any chance I get anywhere I can. I want to say to the Congress and to any and all forces on the earth above it and below it, that long after you have been buried and forgotten, the church of the living God will march on triumphant. Seventy percent of the congressmen targeted by the Christian voice are defeated. The crusade moves on, pushing for legislation to make their views the law of the land. You can make the difference by writing your congressmen and senators. Ask it's a sprawling network that uses bill. every available Rest technique. In their moral report cards, they claim the Bible reveals a right way to vote on political issues. From a balanced budget to the Department of Education. Those who disagree are labeled anti-Christian. Through the mail, they magnify what they preach. Part of the billion dollar communication system they've created. Every month, the radical right delivers 10 million pieces of mail to homes across the country. Predicting apocalypse and playing to fear, they solicit money to back their causes as well as urge people to action. It's time for the Christians to do something. And it's time for you In grassroots to workshops, yourself. they teach because new they activists what they know to be true. Now. That even though their views are not shared by the majority, the if theirs is the loudest voice heard, the they can prevail. And it works. Exulting at the defeat of ERA, Phyllis Schlafly is honored by the radical movement. She announces she'll lead two new campaigns against school books that mention women's rights and against the nuclear freeze. Maybe we'll never get those people who answer the Harris polls, but we've got enough of them to do the job. Their we legislative agenda there, expands with their success. And we Led by Washington this. political operatives and Washington money men, they move on a host of fronts, attacking a host of targets. There is a vicious, all-out satanic attack upon the American home. The whole concept of anti-submission and independence, the whole concept that is being perpetrated upon our society today, that is before the Congress and the Senate right now, and that is who's going to have this right, that right, or the other. When two people in a family become absolutely legally equal, there is no head, both become independent of each other, and love is destroyed. I uh, agree with capital punishment, and I believe that homosexuality is one of those that could be coupled with uh, murder and, and other sins. It would be the government that um, is, sits upon this land who would be executing the homosexuals. It's interesting to me at great political rallies how you have a, a Protestant to pray and a Catholic to pray, and then you have a Jew to pray. With all due respect for those dear people, 
My friend, God Almighty does not hear the prayer of a Jew, for how in the world can God hear the prayer of a man who says Jesus Christ is not the true Messiah? The NAACP, for instance, Benjamin Hooks, he's not prophesying riots in the streets. I believe he's commissioning them. I believe their attitude is, if we don't get our way, we'll riot. Take all of the difficulties, take the divorce courts, take the orphanages, every sin in the world. Every sin in the world can largely be placed at the feet of a liberal pulpit. America is corrupt. She's drunk, duped, sinful, perverted, and godless. And her doom is as certain as God, unless she turns in repentance and comes to the altar of God in complete confession. Did you hear what I just said? America is doomed. Any issue can become part of the holy war. In Indiana, the moral majority claims laws against child abuse are not compatible with the Bible. They rally around a man accused of beating his son, a charge made by the boy's grandparents. I'm uh, Dr. Greg Dixon. I'm pastor of the Indianapolis Baptist Temple in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm uh, the National Secretary of Moral Majority, and I'm uh, State Chairman of, uh, of the Indiana uh, Moral Majority. And can you tell us why you're here today? Yes, I'm here uh, to protest this uh, horrible child abuse law that was passed by the Indiana General Assembly a few years ago. And what they're doing, they're establishing Gestapo agencies all over the state of Indiana called child abuse or child protection agencies. They've taken this little boy out of his home and, uh, you know, for no apparent reason at all outside of what we would consider just normal biblical discipline. I talked to one attorney who said he locks his child in a closet whenever they disobey. Fundamentalist Christians believe the Bible and it even says that the, the blueness of a wound cleanseth the inward parts. Who owns the child? The state or the parents? Does anyone own the child? Does the child have any rights? God owns the children and he gives the parents the right to raise those children. In months of protest and demonstration, Reverend Dixon and his followers are the loudest voice heard in the legislature. And they succeed in weakening the child abuse law in a year when eight children die of abuse in the state. Dixon moves on, using the story of this battle to raise money for the same fight against the same laws in other places. Everywhere, it seems, children are key to their plans you to think with me on some of the ideas about us. A moral majority leader, Reverend LaHaye, says they're engaged in a battle for the mind and calls public education the single most dangerous force in a child's life. He takes aim at schools like this one, where a fourth grade teacher leads her class in discussing citizenship. Citizens should have different ideas so that they can improve their city. Courtney? I think we should be free to spur express our opinions. The radical right says children shouldn't have opinions, shouldn't be taught how to think, but what to think, as in their own schools. There are half a million students enrolled in what Jerry Falwell calls the boot camps of the movement. This is the lecture for Pace 8. Organization. Now, Dr. Howard. You need lines of responsibility defined, lines of communication. The monitor should be responsible to the supervisor, and the supervisor to the principal, and the principal to the pastor. Misunderstandings can easily prove, and Satan is always looking for a place where he can get his toe in the door. Number six, Christian. This is not a private school, it's a Christian school. Christian. Number seven, scripture. Have you memorized the scripture? Scripture. Number eight, worry. It's a sin to worry. Worry. Many of these schools are supplied by the company founded by Reverend Donald Howard, whom Falwell calls the driving force in Christian education today. Falwell and Pat Robertson call for the end of public education, predicting their schools will equal public schools in number by 1992, as any group in the country can pay $5,000 and buy a teacherless, ready-made school in a box. They don't take 
But now, their chosen battleground is the public school, as in Texas, where pressure from radical activists has convinced the state textbook committee to bar every new dictionary from Texas classrooms. If the classroom cannot be uplifting and teach decency, it is in opposition to the entire purpose of education. The committee it hears only those who protest, and much of that comes from Norma Gabler and her staff. Criticizing new books line by line, they lobby against the mention of slavery, poverty, evolution, even computers. They protest that concepts are never as good as facts. When the Gablers force a change here, their power is felt nationwide because a book revised for as big a customer as Texas becomes the only version offered anywhere. The battle for the mind is fought on many fronts. The town of St. David, Arizona is one of hundreds of communities where there have been attempts to remove books from schools and libraries in the last few years. Here the controversy erupts when a Phyllis Schlafly organizer comes into town for a meeting at the local church. All five members of the school board are there. Many schools are exposing students to humanist philosophy and beliefs. The Schlafly leader shows a film from Robertson's Christian Broadcasting Network, implying that 42nd Street is what's happening in St. David's schools. That event, says a teacher, fired up the town. The school board names these women to a review committee. And with advice from Schlafly's group, they set out to examine every teacher and book. I know when I called in about this committee, I never got the information I needed. But the committee does not seek everyone's opinion. They work behind closed doors and begin to focus their attention on one young teacher, Michael Bowden and his reading list. In reports that are destroyed before the public sees them, the committee recommends Lord of the Flies and a Hemingway short story be removed. And though the board agrees to a public meeting to listen to both sides, it seems clear most minds are already made up. As far as Lord of the Flies, I don't know, personally, I think the fate of the sow's head would be appropriate for the book. Let's put it on a stick and put it on a remote island in some forgotten shelf of a library and uh, not on a stick in front of the class. They keep telling me the reason I have to read these books is, and stories is to face this big world, to learn how to cope with it. And I don't believe it. I don't see how a book is different from a magazine. I don't see how a book can teach me any more than the newspaper can. Golding's view of man and society would be true if there were no God. Therefore, I, as a member of the review committee, feel justified in labeling his life view as godless and hopeless. I disagree with the forming of this committee where they have no professional educators on it or administrators or students. There are those in St. David upset with, with the, the committee's actions, committee but they are surprised action. and unorganized without support among the board. But I don't believe the book should be banned. I don't believe any book should be banned because that's the first step to losing our rights. I've never seen a teacher here before where the children all respect and like so much as they do him. Stand behind him. Talk with him. He's not going to corrupt our children. This censorship of, or condemnation or criticism of one teacher seems to be very minuscule and very unimportant. But we must realize in the history of this world that this is the way something that finally ended up in the book burning of Berlin began. And one day it was not only that teacher, not only that professor, but it was the minority religions like you have here in St. David that went down the drain. These small erosions must be watched very carefully and must be stopped before they get to a position where they're absolutely impossible to stop, where the government has the power to do away with everything that is dear to everyone, starting out with one small teacher in one small community. I would like to make the motion that the current reading list be adopted as a supplemental. When it comes to their decision, balance, the board is not content just to approve the committee recommendation. Instead, they hear a motion to eliminate every book from Bowden's reading list, including works by Steinbeck, Conrad, even Mark Twain. Those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed by nay. 
That motion is carried. And in a second vote, they move beyond the one teacher to every class in the school, banning all required reading lists. Very late that night, Bowden and another teacher, Roger Halstead, describe how teachers in St. David feel. Threatened right now. You know, we don't know, you know, what kinds of things we can do in the classroom. We don't understand exactly, you know, what's, what they want of us. And, and, it, and, it's, and it's a touchy situation. It feels like a cloud. You know, there's, a, there's, there's something over us right now that, that's relatively scary, especially in these kind of economic times. It makes it very difficult. If someone objects, apparently, uh, we can no longer discuss the book in class. If you cannot discuss a novel in class, you simply cannot teach it. I feel that the climate is not conducive to, you know, to any kind of education. And I, and I really think the kids are being hurt. Yeah, they're just really think. being taken for a ride. They're being At the end of the school year, the contracts for these two teachers are not renewed. We must realize in the history of this world that this is the way something that finally ended up in the book burning of Berlin began. I'd like everyone to remember that this is a celebration, not a funeral. Praise God. Let's be happy about this. Hey, let's make a movement out of it. Yeah. 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 to burn. Yeah. No one should have any of this stuff. Yeah. Go along with us, victory in Jesus. As dozens of books and records burn in dozens of communities, what is destroyed is the notion that people should be able to have differing opinions or ideas. And the attack moves across the country. Whether it's a march of students from Reverend Howard's schools in Ohio, or a voting booth, or a public library, or public school, one can hear the echo of Falwell's words. The church, he says, should be a disciplined, charging army. Christians, like slaves and soldiers, ask no questions. We are fighting a holy war. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pledge to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. All right, let's sing Ohio for Jesus, we Christian youth proclaim. Ohio for Jesus, we Christian you proclaim. Ohio for Jesus, to honor his great name. Ohio for Jesus, to call the word to bring. Ohio to Jesus, our state must know their king. Ohio for Jesus, with diligence we can. In training and battle, to honor his command. Ohio for Jesus, set all the world to claim. For Jesus, our Savior, praise to his holy name. Forty million people can uh, amend the Constitution if they had a mind to. They can elect a president. They can throw out a president. We can elect any official. We can change or make any law. And that's exactly what we intend to do. Why do we have to compromise to please anybody? The judgment seat, when you see those people that you're compromising with in hell, you're going to have their blood on your hands. This is where we fall into trouble is when we compromise our values to include all people think in the schools that they can teach equality. Well, this is what we're fighting against. Ultimately, everything can be reduced to right and wrong. Everything. There are offices in Congress. The first time I walked in, you know, I had to sit in the back. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, I had to stand up like this. Yes, sir. When they were talking to me, yes, sir, yes, sir. And now, they just roll out that red carpet for me. And I walk in because I represent I represent Jesus' people. Let me tell you something else about the character of God. If necessary, God would raise up a tyrant, a man who might not have the best ethics to protect the freedom interests of the ethical and the godly. Every scene you've witnessed is happening in America today. Make no mistake, the power of the radical right is growing. Both political parties are making more and more concessions to them.
As a result, our laws are being shaped by radical right demands. The proof is everywhere. 